Welcome to the Primal Foundations podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Anthony Chafee. Dr. Chafee is a neurosurgical resident, nutritional medicine expert, and the host of the very successful podcast, The Plant-Free MD. Dr. Chafee, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you very much. Good to meet you, and uh, thank you for having me on. Absolutely. This is an honor to have you on the podcast. I'm looking forward to chopping it up with you and going over some important topics. And I know you've shared this, you know, your carnivore origin story on numerous podcasts, but for the listeners who might, might not be familiar with you, can you share, you know, a brief introduction of what personally led you to the carnivore diet? Yeah, of course. So uh, for me, it was, it was quite some time ago. So about 24 years ago, when I was in my undergraduate degree uh, at the University of Washington, I was... Well, I'd already taken botany, biology, already understood about plant toxins and how they defended themselves because they, they couldn't move or run away or fight back like animals can. So they had to have other means of defenses, like any, every, every form of life has a defense. And so plants make about a million different defensive chemicals to stop animals and insects from eating them. And I, I knew that and I understood that. But then when I was taking cancer biology, my professor really hammered that home in respects to how that affects human health and actually pointed out that that the plants that we eat on a normal basis that are you know termed edible so that they 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 don't kill you if you eat them right away that doesn't mean that they're devoid of toxins and they're devoid of harm and just like smoking cigarettes doesn't kill you that day drinking alcohol doesn't kill you that day necessarily if you unless you overdose um but you know low grade exposure to these things over time will will damage you and, and cause significant illness and harm and probably will die young and so he was pointing this out with all the different fruits and vegetables that we would eat on a normal daily basis, grains, legumes, all these sorts of things. And he was pointing out that they had actually studied this and that they had identified dozens, if not over a hundred known carcinogens in just the normal produce items that we eat on a daily basis. So he specifically told us that, and this is 24 years ago, that that Brussels sprouts had 136 identified carcinogens in them, that mushrooms had over 100, that spinach, kale, lettuce, celery, cabbage, cucumber, broccoli, all the other sorts of fruits and vegetables that you've eaten on a normal daily basis often had um, any, anywhere from 60 to over 100 known carcinogens in them. And they're quite abundant. We know from the work of Dr. Bruce Ames and, you know, a decade earlier that the naturally occurring toxins were... 10,000 times more abundant by weight than the pesticides we were spraying on them. You know, so we talked about how you know, pesticides are so bad and they are, but they're actually, they're actually less, you know, there, there's less of them than the actual natural toxins and the natural toxins in plants, say in mushrooms were hundreds of times more likely to cause cancer than the pesticides that were being sprayed on them. In that case, ALAR in that, in that study with uh, professor Ames from UC Berkeley, so we were we were quite blown away by this, and and uh, and he was even saying that he didn't eat salads or vegetables, wouldn't let his kids eat vegetables, because in his words, plants were trying to kill you. So I was like, right, never gonna eat those again. And so I just I just naturally stepped into that because I just refused to eat anything that grew out of the ground. I wasn't gonna eat any plant, and and I was like, oh, what the hell do I eat? And just defaulted into eggs and meat, and so. I did that for a number of years, never felt better, uh, never had a you know, better athletic performance, better energy and, um, and, uh, you know, better you know, cognition and, 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 uh, and, and I didn't have brain fog. I barely had allergies. My asthma largely went away. So it was a huge, huge benefit to me. I ended up slipping off of that just because, you know, you end up doing that unless you, unless you know why you're doing something to a significant degree, you know, eventually sort of things start creeping back in. And I, and I noticed that I started not feeling as good. And in my, at 25, 26, when I, I had slowly slipped off only a little bit of things like whole foods, but mostly meat, but just a little bit of things were slipping back in. I, I noticed I just didn't feel nearly as good. Wasn't playing nearly as well. Was getting sores and flames, was getting little pulls and tears and achy muscles and joints that I, I normally never had. And that was very strange to me. And I was trying to figure out what, what the hell was going on. I just chalked it up to age. But years later, you know, when I was 38, I came across this. There's no humans just really are 
carnivores. We're apex predators, top of the food chain. I learned that when I was in second grade. And, uh, but it didn't, it didn't click in about how important that was. And so I looked back and I said, okay, well, no, that's actually what I was doing for five years of my life. And I wasn't eating anything else. I wasn't taking vitamins or, or supplements or anything like that. And I felt amazing. That was, that was a time I've never felt better. I've always been trying to get back to how I felt in my early twenties and could never figure it out. I mean, there were, there was, you know, it was, a, it was a two month difference between age 25, feeling like a superhero and age 25 and a bit and not feeling all that great. It was just like, Whoa, what the hell happened? You know, it was the, the difference was, um, uh, crumbed chicken. That was it. It was just chicken with mm. crumbs on it. I was still eating meat. I was still eating eggs, nothing else. It was just crumbs on this chicken. I remember thinking like, well, dose mix the poison, you know, it's probably not that big of a deal. And that's what people are saying now. Yes. Well, there's poisons in plants. Yes. But dose makes the poison. Yeah. What's the dose? It's very small. <laughs> it's like just crumbs on a chicken. And so that was, that was enough to, to, you know, take the edge off my game and make me not feel great at all. And then, you know, once one thing slipped in, I was able to convince myself that a little bit was okay. And then a little bit more came and a little bit more came and a little bit more came. And pretty soon I, I never ate a processed food diet. I never ate the standard diet. I was in a very, very clean, whole food, meat-based approach. It was always very high in meat, typically lean meat, because that was, you know, that was the fashion of the time. And uh, and I'd have a salad just because you're supposed to have salad. And <laughs> that was pretty much it. But that was massive difference, massive, massive difference. Uh, but just by adding those little things. And then at 38, I said, you know, right, that's what I was doing. I was living as a carnivore. We're carnivores. And so like all animals, when you feed them something that they're not really designed for, they get sick. That's why there's signs of the zoo say, don't feed the animals. It makes them very sick uh, to eat something that they're not supposed to. And we, we forget that that applies to us. And so I said, okay, right. I knew it. I knew plants were trying to kill me, get really stupid things. And I just, I just dropped it. And I was at that point, I was just eating spinach, kale, broccoli, you know, all like the, the so-called best greens that are definitely not and, uh, and lean meat and, and not all that much meat. And I was always hungry. I didn't feel great. I was very inflamed. I was overweight and I didn't feel great. And I, uh, stopped eating the greens, started eating a lot more meat, a lot more fatty meat. And I, I dropped 20, 23 pounds in 10 days. And then I just started shredding fat and stacking on muscle. In fact, I was replacing the fat I was losing with muscle I was gaining. So I actually stayed the exact same weight for you know six months. Uh, but I was transforming in the mirror and I just felt amazing. And then two weeks into it, I felt so good that I'm like, right, I'm going back to play, play rugby. And, uh, and, and so I did 38, I was back out playing high level rugby and just felt amazing. So it's, um, it's something that I, I was then a doctor and now I actually knew what was going on. It's like, okay, I'm going to look into this, you know, what do we know and what can we prove? What can we show in the data? And I started, you know, digging through the literature and because I was, I had just come back from doing humanitarian work in Bangladesh. So I was, I had, I had time before I started, um, my next contract actually coming to Australia, um, that I, I just started digging into the research and I was spending, you know, eight, 10 hours a day, just, just reading studies on and trying to ask questions and look up in the literature, uh, you know, what, you know, ask a question, have a hypothesis and then find information, which you can test it against. If you have two competing theories, you, there sh should be evidence with which you can test those theories against. And that's what I tried to do. And I just, I just kept finding more and more and more data showing that, that this was the right way for us to eat a, uh, it, it, from the, <laughs> from a biological point of view, from an ancestral point of view, an evolutionary biological point of view, from a botanical point of view, uh, but also a physiological point of view and from experimental data with highly animal-based, high meat-based, high animal fat-based ketogenic diets that have been used in thousands of controlled trials in humans and animals, but more, most importantly in humans to address specific chronic diseases and issues. And they found it to be extremely helpful and extremely beneficial for all sorts of medical conditions, ranging from autoimmune issues to diabetes to cancer, and and obviously weight loss as well. And so, you know, it's something that made sense to me because you know a carnivore diet is the, an animal-based ketogenic diet, so that sort of fit in as well. And so, it just um, I just started to really, really dig in and try to find out as much as I could. And then when I you know, knew all that. I started applying it. Well, I was already applying it to my life, but then my family started taking it up 
my my friends and my and my teammates started taking it up and everyone was getting these fantastic results and uh, I started talking about it more and more and applying it to my patient population and they just started having better and better results and so now I've been trying to focus on that as much as I can especially in my my private practice I have a private practice in basically you know fixing metabolic health and uh, and addressing the so-called non-communicable chronic diseases, hormonal disruptions, all these other sorts of things with diet and lifestyle first, and then you fill in the gaps with with medications. But especially things like hormones, they just sort themselves out largely. Um, you know, I have seventy-two-year-old men tripling their their testosterone without any sort of medications, and uh, just by changing their diet and uh, and lifting weights and and um, you know being more active. So it's something that I've found to be extremely beneficial in my work as, as a doctor. And it, I, I, honestly, I haven't, you know, if you could, you know, talk about all the different benefits of this and say, Hey, you know, here's a pill for this. I mean, just the stores would be empty. I mean, they would just, there'd be a worldwide shortage instantly, but it's available for free. Anybody can do it at any time and you can just maintain good health and then use the medical field for what it's supposed to be, which is accidents, emergencies, pregnancy and childbirth, infectious disease, congenital and genetic uh, issues, poisoning, toxicities, malnutrition, those sorts of things. That That's something that we can we can handle, right? Uh, these chronic diseases, that's diet and lifestyle. And uh, you sort that out and then you just get on with living and just, uh, and then deal with the, the, the acute issues as they come. Uh, I think Dana White now is, he's, you know, all over Instagram and he's talking about, he goes, I'll never go for my health my personal health, I'll never go to a, a medical doctor again. He goes, if I break my arm, I'll go to the doctor. You know, I need a, a surgery, yeah. I'll go to the doctor. But he goes, when it comes to medical health, yeah. he goes, I, I, there's a lot more avenues that I'm going to be taking. And yeah. I'm just curious, when was, you You did that botany class, like what year was that? Well, roughly oh, around. I was like two, well, that so the, uh, I had taken botany prior to that, but the cancer biology class I took in, I think it was 2000, 2001, something like that. Yeah, what a trailblazer that professor is. Like, if if yeah. you hear that, like, I don't give my kids vegetables. Yeah. People will be like, "Are you yeah. really?" But yeah, imagine yeah. like if you don't sit in that class, like that's the domino effect really doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, that's it. You know, and if I if I hadn't done that, I would have just kept eating a, you know, a, a healthy, you know, uh, lean meat and vegetable sort of diet, and you know, I would have been fine. I'm sure, but I would have been a lot better off than most people. I never ate processed junk food, didn't eat sugar or anything like that. Didn't drink during the rugby season, things like that. So, you know, I would have been better off in general, but this was, this just took me to another level. And, and it's, you're right. I mean, it was, it was really, that was really pivotal for me because I, I lived as a carnivore for five years. And then when I came across this stuff, I saw, well, my brother saw Dr. Sean Baker on Joe Rogan, you know, seven years ago or so. And he was just blown away. He's like, man, there's this doctor, you know, he's played, you know, he's a doctor. He played professional rugby as well. And, and he's saying you can get all of, all the nutrition you need from meat. And then instantly you're like, oh, well, that can't be right. But then, you know, the, the, you know, the back of my head, my back of my brain just went, oh, hold on a second. I mean, like we did that, you know, I did that for five years and I've never felt better in my entire life. And I remember even thinking at the time, I was like, hey, should I like take a multivitamin or eat a banana or something? Like, do I need some vitamins? <laughs> and, and and I just thought, well, you know, I feel good and my gums aren't bleeding. So let's just ride this out and see what happens. <laughs> and, and I never, I never had a problem. And I never, never took any supplements to never take, take multivitamins or anything, anything like that. Didn't vitamin C, nothing. Yeah. No, and no, so, no scurvy. No, not yet. You know, we'll see. So it's been seven years, maybe year eight. That'll be, that'll be the time, you know? So, um, so that's the thing. It's, um, it, if I didn't have that, I didn't have that experience and that would have been much more jarring to me. Um, and I still almost didn't, didn't watch it just because I, I wasn't, I didn't really, you know, I didn't have like three hours of my life to you know spend watching like a podcast. So it was just like, I was just like, Oh, I don't know if I ever really want to watch that. So it actually took me months before I watched this thing. Mm -hmm. And and I, I was in Bangladesh, so I was doing humanitarian work, didn't watch it the whole time. And then I got back and he's just, you know, sort of medicine again. I'm like, I should really watch that. And then I did, I'm like, this this guy's bang on. And and in fact, I knew other things that complemented what he was saying as well, that you know, cholesterol was an absolute hoax, that fructose was a lot a much more likely um uh, factor in, in heart disease and, and chronic disease, seed oils as well. But specifically at the time, uh, uh, fructose, there's a lot of research on that from Dr. Robert Lustig from UCSF and, and the health plants are toxic. 
you know, and how, how you don't want to eat them. And so uh, that made sense to me. All of a sudden, it's just like all the other things that he was saying just made a lot of sense. And then I, I tracked that back to my own experiences as a, as a, as a athlete on a carnivore diet, not called a carnivore diet, they aren't just eating meat, a no plant diet, and, uh, and how great I felt. And I was right. I knew these damn plants were a problem. And so, you know, I cut them all out. I felt great, you know, felt absolutely amazing. And so, you know, I'm, you know, if I saw that, you know, I would have still known about the fructose, I would have still known about the cholesterol, you know, I wouldn't have known about the plants. And, um, you know, so I don't know how it would have affected me. I, it, it may have, it, you know, probably would have made sense because it did make sense, you know, especially in that context. But I, I don't, I don't know if it would have had the profound, you know, gong moment of just that, like, yep, this is it. This is, this is something very significant. And so, yeah, it's very lucky, you know, um, Nobel prize winner, uh, Lou Alvarez, uh, as people says, Oh, he just got lucky, you know, discovering this, that, and the other. And it was like, you know, uh, luck is just, you know, the Avenue where, uh, where preparation and opportunity meet, you know? And so if you, if you hadn't do, done the preparation and hadn't had something ready to go, and then that right little moment to give you that, oof, that little idea, you, know, you, you never have it, you know? So, it, I was very lucky, very lucky that I had that experience and that professor as well, because that was, that was a very, uh, yeah, that was, that was a sort of watershed moment in my life as it turns out, you know, both for my health in my early twenties, but then, uh, you know, now with my work now. And so if I ever, if I ever track him down, like I'm getting that guy a, a meat basket, you know, he's definitely, <laughs> definitely buying him Take, steak. taking him out for a couple of steaks. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'll, I'll buy that guy a cow. You know, like, <laughs> Yeah. Now you mentioned this, uh, as you were talking to, and I, I want to kind of start here of, you mentioned like humans have been these apex predators for, you know, over 2 million years. And, and how does that perspective support the idea that humans are primarily adapted to eat meat? Well, if you, you know, the thing is, is that, is that, um, you know, animals in the wild, they don't, they don't have a bunch of nutritionists and people with, you know, uh, nutrition degrees and things or doctors or all these sorts of things. And yet somehow they know how to eat and what to eat and how much to eat. Why the hell is that? You know, because, uh, they go by your natural instincts, you know, you, you, you know, people gravitate towards meat, even though we've been vilifying meat and saying it's horrible and bad for you for decades. You know, people are just like, yeah, you know, but I, I just feel better on it and I like it. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to stop eating it. Um, you, know, you could say a similar thing about processed food and sugar and all that sort of stuff. That's a, that's an unnatural food. I mean, that's something that's highly processed. That's you have food scientists, very clever people. They actually recruited them over when, when the tobacco industry started going downhill, um, tobacco companies actually bought up the major, uh, food manufacturers in, in the eighties and nineties. And, uh, and they actually shifted all their tobacco scientists into the food sciences. And they started saying like, okay, let's make these as addictive as possible. So they, you know, they, they identify little chemicals and compounds that give that, ooh, eat that more button, but don't actually satiate. Don't you don't actually give you any nutrients. So because your stomach is not dumb and your body is not stupid. You, you have receptors in your stomach. You don't just track calories, you track nutrients. And so you're, you, you have receptors in your stomach that track up the vagus nerve to your brain that tell your brain how many nutrients are in your stomach. And so you're eating this junk food that has that, Ooh, flavor, but then it goes in your stomach. It's like, yeah, there's nothing here. You need to keep eating. Let's go. And it also triggers, you know, it triggers a hormonal response and hormonal eating and, and disruption and with your blood sugar and leptin and insulin and all these other, other sorts of things that cause you to overeat. But when you're eating a natural, your natural diet, you know, when cows are eating grass, when lions are eating gazelle, they know how much to eat. Something in there internally tells them that. Um, and so there should be something that that we that we eat. So you don't need a nutrition degree. In fact, you don't want one because it just complicates the matter. If, you know, if an amoeba can figure out what to eat, then without a nutritionist, then we should be able to do it. Right. So if you want to know what, what the nutrition is, I mean, zookeepers don't go around passing out surveys to nurses to see what lions eat. You know what I mean? That's what, <laughs> but that's what Harvard does to try to figure out what people are supposed to eat. And, um, you know, they just look, what do lions eat in the wild? They eat meat, right? What do koalas eat in the wild? They eat eucalyptus, right? So in the zoo, that's what they feed them, you know? And they know that you, you can actually harm them if, they, if you don't 
uh, feed them what they're supposed to eat in the wild. And so like, why wouldn't that apply to us? And when you look at humans in the wild, uh, when they have access, they're eating meat. And so in order to understand what, what an uh, animal eats, you need to understand what they've been eating the longest and what they're most adapted to. What you've been eating the longest is what you're most adapted to. And so humans, even though we come from an herbivorous past, you know, 8 million years ago, it's 8 million years ago, and we have been apex predators for at least two, two and a half million years and eating a lot of meat before that. And so for millions of years. And so that's what all the best evidence shows. And so the best evidence shows that we've been apex predators, top of the food chain for at least two to two and a half million years. And during the ice ages, when the ice shells were coming down, our ancestors are actually going up into the ice, not, not away, not running away towards the equator where all the, you know, the fruit and berries were, we were running up into the ice where the mammoths were, because that's what we were hunting. Right. And so it was actually those people who, those early people who really manifested or, or they were able to survive as apex predators who started hunting, who were able to survive. Everyone else died out. There's actually this bottleneck period where most people died out. And there was the ones that survived were the ones that actually figured out how to be apex predators and manifest our destiny as apex predators. And that's when you see this inflection point, you see this, um, the, the height and brain size of our ancestors sort of slowly going up, slowly going up, slowly going up until about two and a half million years ago. And when the ice ages hit and we became apex predators and all of a sudden there's this inflection point where it just goes bang, it's just this exponential growth, in both height and brain size. And that brain size exponentially going up until about 15,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago with agriculture and bang, straight down, literally straight line down. And our brains shrank by 11% for men, 17% for women. And the adult male height dropped by five inches. And that wasn't over hundreds of years or even thousands of years. That was overnight. That was instantly. And so you, you know, you can't say that that's an adaptation that that's malnutrition. There's other signs of malnutrition too, like shorter femurs, poor wound healing signs of tuberculosis in the spine, things like that. Uh, you know, smaller jaws, poor dentition, crooked teeth. And that didn't happen before agriculture. You can actually tell the difference between a skull pre-agriculture and post-agriculture, there, there are marked differences. The shape of the face and, and skull are very different. And yeah, so you've, you've posted uh, this before. I think you've done it and a couple other people have done like a side-by-side -side of um, two skeleton structures and especially mm -hmm. the skull. And it's like yeah. perfect teeth, you know, bigger, bigger cranium, all that stuff. And then you see like, you, like you were saying, this very small or petite skull, crooked teeth, um, what that's so wild to me that it's just yeah. instantly like that. Yeah. And, and this is, um, you know, this is in textbooks, you know, this is in, you know, um, archeological paleoanthropological textbooks. Right. And there was, there was one, um, that, that I have it on my, my Instagram where it's like two skeletons, one's, one's big and one's small or smaller. And it shows, you know, pre-agricultural man, then post-agricultural man, 10,000 years ago. And it just, you know, drops immediately. And uh, so has all these, these signs of, of, uh, you know, malnutrition and poor wound healing and, and shorter stature and growth. And, you know, at the, at the bottom underneath the picture is from a textbook. It's not me saying this, this is, you know, uh, a professor from Cambridge saying this, um, uh, Stanley Ull, Lezajek or something. I can't pronounce the name, but anyway, it's, um, it's, uh, you know, it says at the bottom there. Uh, I'll, I'll read it out to you. When populations around the globe started turning to agriculture around 10,000 years ago, regardless of their location and regardless of the type of crops, a similar trend occurred. The height and health of the people declined. Skeletal analysis suggests that these Neolithic peoples experienced greater physiological stress due to undernutrition and infectious disease. So this is a, a very clear demarcation in our health and development. And uh, when you look at the average height of a population, that denotes the average health of a population. And so we saw this all around. So it says any, any where and any when this happened and any you know, crop that, that they went to, right? So this happened more recently. This has happened in the last 100 years, 150 years with Native Americans, the Native Australians, the Native Canadians, you know, the Inuit. Um, you know, we see this disparity and we see this change. There was actually a paper in 2001 
that showed that, um, you know, some different sorts of records and measurements and studies that had been done in the late 1800s with the, the, the American, you know, Native Americans in the Great Plains who, you know, traditionally were eating, you know, a bunch of bison and things like that. And there were different heights, but the people in general were the tallest human beings alive on earth. They were the tallest human beings, the tallest um, population of humans on earth. And, um, you know, they, they sort of had a different, you know, range, but like the Cheyenne were typically the tallest. And on average, they were, you know, five foot 10 in America, the adult male height on, on average is five foot eight, right? And so they were taller than we are now. But the, but the, you know, there's other populations that are similar though. So people are like, oh, well, that's tall, but you know, you know, there are other populations, like, you know, the Danes and things like that are pretty tall, you know, the Nordic people, stuff like that. We eat a lot of meat. And, um, but the interesting thing was, was that at the time that that study was done and those measurements were taken, the Native Americans were already on reservations. They weren't out living in the wild, eating a carnivorous diet. They had, they were on reservations now and they were, they were, they had their, their normal uh, life and diet, you know, the Buffalo had all been wiped out at this point, right? That was on purpose. And so they weren't full carnivores anymore. And in those records at the time, they even said the people had already shrunk and that, you know, they were, they were much taller in previous generations and that now they were actually shorter and they were still the tallest human beings on earth. Right. But they, they said that if they had you know, measure these people a hundred years ago, they, they likely would have been much taller. And when you look at the mammoth hunters, you know, the prehistoric mammoth hunters that they were very tall. I mean, there's some could have been on average six foot two to six foot four in some areas. So average, right. So I'm six foot three. So I'd be average. Right. And I'm, uh, I'm, I'm barely pushing. <laughs> I'm lucky if I'm five, seven on a good day. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, it's, um, it's, it's pretty remarkable. You know, there was, um, there were delegates that came over from, you know, the great plains, um, in the, by the great lakes, um, uh, that came to see president, then president Jefferson, you know, um, you know, very early on in American history, you know, before the, the reservations and before the, the Buffalo were wiped out, wiped out the bison. And he was a tall guy. He was like six, two, you know, so he's he not a short man. And, uh, he was saying that these guys were absolute giants, that they were just huge. They were way taller than him. And he was just like the tallest people he'd ever seen. And, um, you know, paintings of these, these people at the time, there was a, there was a guy who went out, I guess you forget his name, but he, he went out over there and he was painting these guys and, uh, and people were looking at it and going like, oh, well, you know, the native savage, look at their head. There's a small proportion to their body. Like, ah, oh, they just have such small brains, uh, that, that, that makes sense. Uh, because they're obviously not as smart as the white man. And uh, and then you looked at the scale and you looked at what they were against. These guys were like nearly seven feet tall, right? So they actually had big ass heads. It's just wow. that they had massive bodies, right? And so uh, that was that was that was pretty surprising to these people. And you know, it it you know, as, as, you know, we we can even look at this. Well, you can look at this from a from a chronic disease point of view. Previously, they didn't have these chronic diseases. They called them the diseases of the West for the for a reason. It was only Western civilizations that had this. Now, anthropologists call this, you know, talking from from injuries and infectious disease. To then, when you go into uh, more civilized sort of societies from primitive cultures, they they then transition and the health afflictions and that changes to um, diseases of civilization. Uh, which are the chronic diseases that we're treating, diabetes, cancer, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, you know, autoimmunity, these sorts of things. And uh, they didn't, they didn't exist to any, any significant degree or sometimes to no degree at all in these native populations, especially when they were just eating meat. And then when they transitioned their height and health declined, and part of that health decline was they started getting these diseases of civilization. And they started getting these chronic diseases. And now, because they're more susceptible to this, you know, European ancestors and other, other people who've had agriculture longer, they've, they've had a bit of adaptation. And we've been adapted to meat. First of all, you don't need to adapt to meat. Meat, is, there's nothing harmful in meat. It's just very, very healthy and bioavailable. So there's nothing harmful in meat in the first place. You don't have to adapt to it. Even herbivores opportunistically eat other animals. Horses will eat little 
uh, you know, chickens and, and ducklings and things like that, or in bunnies. I mean, there's, there's plenty of videos on the internet if people want to see that of different, you know, elk and cows and horses eating that, uh, little animals and things like that. But, um, so there's nothing wrong with meat. You actually don't have to adapt to it, but you do have to adapt to plants. You do have to adapt to those plant toxins. And we've only had about 10,000 years to do that. That is no time at all. And when you're talking about evolutionary biology point of view, but it, we did have a little bit of adaptation. So we get diabetes, we get heart disease, we get obesity and, and cancer and autoimmunity and all these sorts of things. Um, some more easily than others, depending on their, their genetics, the native populations the native Americans, far higher rates of diabetes and chronic disease and autoimmunity than, than, uh, the other Americans and other Canadians and other Australians, far higher, far higher rates of chronic diseases. In fact, when I came to Australia to practice medicine, I was told day one that whatever it says on the, on the card, like their, their folder, for um, you know their age and things like that, add twenty years, because they just they just age much more quickly and they get diseases much more quickly. So if you have someone in their thirties, you have to consider them in the geriatric population because they're just going to get the cancers and heart disease and COPD and all these other sorts of things way way quicker than than other people do. Normally, you're looking for like you know peaks and things peak in their fifties or sixties or you have a peak in the twenties and in the fifties and all these sorts of things. There's all these you know, these, these statistics that we use in medicine to, to see, because a lot of, a lot of things can have a lot of the same symptoms. And so you're trying to, you know, play on the balance of, of probability, what something could be to make your diagnosis. Sometimes it's just clear as day, like that's just path and mnemonic, like that's what that is, but oftentimes it's not. And so you just have to, you have to play odds. And so for them, you can't, you can't rely on that. You can't rely on like, well, it's really more common in your sixties and, but you know, guys, guys 24 like oh that can't be but it can in those populations because they get it much more early and so you know that so you see that that decline in health and it makes sense you know because they've had they haven't had 10,000 years to adapt to these poisons they've only had 100 200 years to adapt to these poisons not really even 200 years and so that that's 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 literally no time at all so they haven't adapted at all and so these plant toxins affect them much much more severely and so they get these same diseases and we get these same diseases, but neither of us get the disease if we don't eat these foods. If we're all eating uh, a carnivorous diet, like our natural diet, we don't get these diseases. They, they just go away. I mean, I, I heard that when I was a child in America, they said, when eating a Western diet, the Native Americans were four times as likely to get all the chronic diseases like diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and all the rest that, uh, that the rest of Americans were. I remember thinking at the time, well, like, well, doesn't that, it's just only when eating a Western diet. Okay. Well, you know, what that means is that the food is causing the disease, you know, because it's, it's when they're eating a Western diet and we eat a Western diet and we get these diseases. We just get it at a lower rate. Okay. And what's a, what's a non-Western diet? What are they eating that we're not and vice versa? Um, and uh, no one told me at the time, but you know, of course they were traditionally carnivores. And so, that makes sense. You know, we have these plant toxins, you need to avoid them or else they're going to damage you. And they're more susceptible to them because they haven't had 10,000 years to adapt to them. And, um, but you can also look at this, I mean, in, uh, you know, the Inuit, you know, they had basically no chronic disease in the early 1900s. And uh, now that's steadily coming up. And then, um, you know, different populations, you know, the Maasai, when they start getting incorporated into, you know, other aspects of society, sometimes there's like, there's uh, people that, uh, will be closer to the cities or they'll start incorporating, you know, more Western food or God forbid, junk food, like Coca-Cola is, is, is very predatory. They'll go into these villages in the middle of rural Africa and, and sell out bottles of Coke in 15 minutes because they have no idea how bad this stuff is. And uh, now they're getting tooth decay and diabetes and all these sorts of things. Dr. Mark Hyman from uh, from Cleveland Clinic, he uh, he's a functional medicine doctor. He went out there, and uh, and he was living with them and just sort of you know studying them. And he saw this, this Coca Cola truck coming in. Everyone was going crazy on it. And he went to the chief. He said, "Hey, you know, you got to be careful. That that uh, that stuff can cause diabetes and all sorts of other things." And he was really taken aback. He said, what, we're really like diabetes is actually a big problem. That's actually getting worse and worse. And you, you think that could be a cause? Like, yeah, I absolutely think that could be the cause. And so 
you, know, you see this in real time. I mean, even in my own family, it's interesting, you know, as, as the rise in, you know, the rise in plant, you know, plant foods, certainly processed foods, which are plant foods, and the demonization of meat throughout the 20th century. You know, we saw people, you know, changing their eating habits. And my my um my family, I saw my my uh like I'm six foot three, my brother's six foot four. We have another brother who's five foot ten, did not eat a lot of meat. He ate a lot of white rice and tempura sauce. Like that's what he wanted to eat. And he is he is a solid four inches shorter than my brother and I. And um I was much lighter too, you know, all throughout high school, teenage years. You know, like for instance, like, you know, I wrestled, you know, 190 and 215. He wrestled 148 and, you know, at the same at 18, you know, so it's like, it's very different in stature. And, um, and my older brother was bigger than me, you know, at the same age, our, our father and his brothers were anywhere from six foot four to six foot seven. Right. And then their father and his four brothers, there was five of them. They were all pushing seven feet. And they were all born in the early 1900s, 19, wow. you know, 19, you know, tens and twenties. Right. And there's five of these guys, they all played basketball. So you have, you have an automatic like team growing up and he's all, all these other seven footers just dunking on people, you know, like, um, and, uh, so, you know, it's just, just, just shorter and shorter by each generation. And, and it wasn't like we, we didn't eat meat, but, uh, we did not eat fat in my house. And, um, you know, whole grains and all that sort of stuff was, was pushed and we had to eat vegetables and we had to eat this other stuff. And, um, you know, we'd eat meat, but you know, we had to eat other stuff too. So I, all I wanted to eat was meat growing up. That's just your natural instinct and, you know, and, uh, and not getting as, as much as I wanted. I, I did not grow as tall as I would have. It's just, this is how that is, you know? So, um, it, uh, you can see this in, in many different respects and, you know, Maybe, and, and then other people have have different sort of family backgrounds, you know, like some people may have been in, you know, I know a lot of people who, uh, whose parents grew up in Maoist China and uh, were, were you know, forced to, you know, live through uh, famines and forced famines and things like that. And they were basically almost never had meat, like what the meat they could have were whatever they could catch, be it rats or whatever. And that, and that's how they survived. And then they were able to get out and they would get to America. And there's these tiny little short Chinese parents and then bam, six foot four son, because they were, you know, they were just dumping meat into him because they, they knew how important that was. And, and, uh, and it was, it was so rare when they grew up that they really wanted to make sure that they had a lot of it. So, you know, you can see this, you know, working in both directions. And we've had doctors that in the past have like research you know, the true cause of disease, like a Dr. Salisbury, what is it? The relation mm -hmm. of alienation of, and disease. And that's like, that was published in the late 1800s. Yeah. It, yeah. And it's like, we're still talking about disease uh, and the cause of disease today. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. And yeah. So he figured that out. Yeah. So alimentation is your, your digestion, right? So your elementary tract is your digest, digestive tract. And so he, he did a 30 year research project into the optimal nutrition for humans. And he found that if you, if you ate outside of that, that you were getting these diseases, other people simply weren't, and that you could actually reverse a lot of these diseases by going on a pure red meat and water diet, uh, specifically beef. He was, a, he was a big fan of beef. He thought lamb was a distant second and he, yeah. So he, he wrote about this and he found that you could, you could cure and reverse a lot of these, you know, so-called chronic diseases, the diseases of civilization, the diseases of the West, they would just largely go away. So Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, rheumatoid arthritis, gout, tuberculosis, right? So tuberculosis showed up in the fossil record immediately after agriculture. You started seeing signs of tuberculosis, um, infective pockets in the, in the spinal column immediately after uh, uh, agriculture. Right. And so, you know, he was sort of finding that, Hey, you put people on just a meat and water diet, you start eating this, this way again, and actually your immune system can, can keep this under wraps. Tuberculosis is, is typically kept pretty dormant. Uh, your immune system is able to, to bottle it up. However, when you have uh, a, a depressed immune system, it can, it can really hit you hard and have a, have a florid infection that can kill you. And this was, it was a major issue in the 1800s. And so I had actually killed my, my, uh, great grandfather's first wife. And then he remarried to my great grand grandmother. And, um, 
you know, and he almost died from that as well. So it was, it was, it was a very, very serious disease. And, uh, and he found that people were just largely getting over this when you fed them this proper diet and, uh, yeah, wrote this whole book on the relationship between what you eat and the diseases you get. And just like, it was the exact same thing that I'm talking about, which is just these diseases are not diseases. They're toxicities and malnutrition brought about by a, an inappropriate diet for our species, just like every other animal in the zoo or at the park where it says the sign that don't feed them whatever you're eating, typically bread. It don't feed ducks bread, it gives them diabetes. I've seen signs say that don't give ducks bread because it gives them diabetes. What the hell do you think it's doing to you? And then, you know, they have like fatty liver disease was well, alcoholic fatty liver disease. Then all of a sudden, you know, 10 year olds who never drank alcohol in the nineties were still getting fatty liver disease and they were getting adult onset diabetes, which typically only happened to alcoholics in, in uh, you know, the middle, middle ages, uh, in their middle age. And they, uh, so instead of thinking about this going like, Hey, well, well what changed? What happened? They just, nah, it's probably always happening. You know, we just didn't notice it and it's just rename it. So they named it non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and type two diabetes. And so I think, well, we don't know. Why is it called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? Because you don't know what the hell it's caused by and you just know it's not caused by alcohol. Okay, fine. Well, we cause non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in animals that we're uh, cultivating to eat. Uh, this is what foie gras is. It literally means fatty liver. How do, you, how do you make that? You stuck a feeding tube down a duck's throat and you pour grains into its stomach. So you force it to overeat grains and carbs and that gives them a bunch of fatty deposits in their liver and why would we think that that would be different for us you know uh, we see these diseases in animals you know from the things we do to them and yet we say nah, it's fine uh, you know kale used to be given to sheep they tried to give it to them as a feed they had to stop because it was it was killing. They were having stillbirths. The babies were dying. They were getting uh, massive goiters. You know, goiters, your, your thyroid getting enlarged because of things called goitrogens. That's a whole class and family of, of plant toxins that just disrupt the functionality of your thyroid. And you get this big, massive goiter. And so giving these, these animals goiters and, and, and uh, the, the babies were being born, you know, there were stillbirths and they were hugely deformed. They had this like, you know, tennis ball sized goiter popping out of their out of their neck and so like all right well that doesn't work and, and then they give it to cows dairy cows to because they need a lot of feed to uh, produce all that milk but then the people they were giving the milk to started getting goiters right and so then somebody had a bright idea like well why don't we just eat it well that, that sounds like a great idea you know it's just like yeah it kills animals and 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 destroys milk but you know makes milk toxic but yeah you know, i'm sure it's fine i'm sure it's fine to eat and again you know if you're not adapted to something you shouldn't eat it you know, if, we, if, if our ancestors weren't eating it 50,000 years ago during an ice age, don't eat it. It's just, it, it is exactly that simple. And it should be that simple. Like, again, if, if a koala can figure, a koalas don't even have a cerebral cortex. That's the part that you think with. If they can figure out what the hell to eat, we should be able to figure out what to eat. It's not that hard. Like what, what our ancestors were eating 50,000 years ago during an ice age, that's what you eat. If it didn't exist 50,000 years ago during an ice age, don't eat it. It is exactly that simple. And I, I, that, that you're hitting the nail like right on the head right now. And I feel that a lot of people are, are very misinformed and of what mm -hmm. to eat. And it's like, I, I do really great on carnivore. I enjoy it. Like I have this anecdotal piece to it of like my story, your story, these things we share with people of how good we feel. But then there's the the other camp of, well, where's the peer review study? Where's the, uh, show me the white papers and the data, you know, like mm -hmm. from your perspective, when people are kind of trying to figure this out for themselves, like are nutritional studies even trustworthy? Mostly not. <laughs> you know, I mean, they, you, have to, you have to look at, although uh, they're, they're largely garbage. I mean, and, and the majority of them are paid for by the, the, the processed food industry. So the, the processed food industry spends 11 times the amount of money um, on nutritional studies specifically than the NIH, the, the National Institutes of Health. So the vast majority of nutrition papers that are out there are, are paid for by the 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 food companies and this is not this is not to 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 better and further the understandings of human knowledge 
it's um, it's marketing as part of their marketing budget. You know, they're 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 putting out these studies to show that processed foods and seed oils and sugar and all sorts of garbage are great and that meat is bad because that's their that's their business. You know, they make trillions of dollars a year selling this garbage. Um, it's, you know, it's just like any, any drug cartel, you know, they're just, they're just going to push their product. And so I have, you know, sugar cereals and candies and all these things marketed at kids, you know, to get these, these kids hooked early, like any good drug dealer, you, you hook them early and you have them for life. Right. So it's, um, it's no different. It's the exact same tactic. It is a drug. Sugar is a drug. These foods are horrible for your body and they're designed to be addictive. They have designed them to be addictive. There's a, there's a 60 minutes uh, interview where they interviewed some of these food scientists and they talked about these natural flavors. Oh, natural. Oh, natural. It must be good. It's natural. Arsenic's natural. So, you know, probably not, not definitionally good if it's natural. They take these natural flavors, they take these compounds, they identify them, what gives that big boost, explosive, good flavor that your brain is saying, Ooh, that's okay. That's good. This is safe. Take this, eat this. And, uh, they modify it. So you get an even bigger taste explosion and it goes away quickly. So you have a big taste and it goes away and a big taste and it goes away. So that you want the next bite. You want the next piece. You want the next chip, right? You want the next chocolate. You want the next candy. And so if you do, and, and so they even said this and they said, yes, because it, you know, the flavor just stays there. You're not going to eat, you're not going to eat more. So you want to eat more. And they're like, oh, okay. So it makes it a bit, you know, addictive, you know, sort of compulsive eating. They're like, yeah, so you, you eat more. I mean, they're just openly talking about this. They're saying the quiet part out loud. And, um, you know, then one person says like, well, we, you know, we, we like to think of it as something that's, that's, um, you know, that you just want more of, or, you know, some, whatever the hell spin they put on it. But that, that's basically what it is. You know, try, try to make it more addictive and try to make you, you, uh, you know, get into this compulsive eating sort of behavior. And, and, you know, oh, well, if you just limit what you eat, yeah, yeah, yeah good luck, you know, and yeah, you can probably do that. But, you know, that's like saying uh, cocaine's fine if you only do two lines a night. Probably, you know, it's, it's better than the alternative of, of doing 10 bags a night, but uh, good luck. Good luck to you. You know, if you can do just, you know, two lines a night when you go out on the weekends, you just leave, leave it at that and you, and it doesn't go up from there. Good for you. Uh, it's designed to be addictive. It's designed to not stay at, uh, at a low, moderate amount. It is designed to have you compulsively eat. And that's what a lot of people find. And the, you know, they've been fighting really hard against um, allowing food addiction to be actually classified as, as, as a real addiction. And this is why you'll see a lot of influencers. Oh, it's not a real thing. How can you be addicted to something that you need? Well, you don't need Ruffles potato chips, right? It's not, it's not real food. You certainly don't need candy and all this sort of crap. And if it were something that was good for you, you would self-limit automatically like all food does. So if you're eating meat, it tastes good when you're hungry. And then every bite you take tastes slightly less good and slightly less good until finally it doesn't taste good at all. And you just naturally stop because your body is auto-regulating the amount that's coming in because you get this taste response. Your brain says, yes, we want those nutrients. Get that in you. And then it goes into your stomach. And like I said, there's these receptors that track up to your brain and say, okay, now we have more nutrients have a little more nutrients, a little more nutrients. So we don't need that quite as much. So you get this taste response. It's like, yeah, we want it, but we're not that fussed about it. And so it starts tasting less and less good, right? And then eventually your brain's just like, yeah, we don't need it anymore. We're fine. And uh, so even long before you have liquefied and absorbed this stuff, and it's gotten in your system, your brain already knows that you don't need it anymore. And then you, you, you automatically tell it to stop. So that's not addictive. So you're right. You know, you're not, you're not going to get compulsive eating to food, but food is species specific. And just because we eat it and chew it up and, and you know, put it in our mouth and swallow it does not make it food. I mean, you can, even if getting nutrients out of it, that does not make it food. If you, you know, you can get, you know, minerals and vitamins that you have to have that are vital, you know, magnesium, zinc, iron, things like that, that are, they're vital for, for health and, uh, and survival from eating dirt. You know, does that make us dirt divorce? Does that make dirt food? And you can get calories, which are essential. You can get those from drinking Coca-Cola. So you can eat dirt, drink Coke and take a multivitamin. And that's good, right? You know, no, of course it's not. That's, um, that's not food. It doesn't matter how you dress it up. That's not food. And, uh, you know, anything besides our natural evolved diet is not food. 
And, uh, and we have to understand that, you know, food to a koala is very different than food to a panda or to a blue whale. And they, they can't switch around what they're eating or they'll, they'll, they can get very sick. Um, at least when plants are concerned, again, herbivores can eat, can eat meat. 70% of all animal species are carnivores. And, um, uh, you know, and uh, of the herbivores, they opportunistically will eat meat. You know, chimpanzees are considered herbivores, but at the same time, they'll hunt down other chimpanzees, rip them apart and eat them alive. And uh, same with other monkeys and things like that. And, uh, and that's sort of some, some scary Planet of the Apes sort of stuff. The National Geographic actually found that they're actually making spears now and hunting with spears. And it's like, oh, this is going too fast. <laughs> that's not, <laughs> that's probably not good. You know, it's even riding on horseback next, you know, and, uh, and uh, catching people in nets. And so, you know, just, just be careful on that one. And, and you're right. It's the food is it's, it's ultra processed. It's so palatable and it, mm -hmm. and it, like the person doesn't even have it. We don't even have a chance anymore because we like, this is in the, every grocery aisle. We assume it's good. And you mentioned one thing too, and it's, it's really important is you're talking about like my body's identifying the nutrients and, we are very calorie focused, like population of people. And that's all like we're looking at is like the calories and it's just calories are a unit of measurement. It's not even, it's not what the body is looking for. I mean, you're going to have the steak. If you have ground beef, eggs, there's going to be a point where you're like, I think I'm good, but I, mm -hmm. I could sit down and very easily take down an entire pizza without bat, without batting an eye. And yeah, even though yeah. I feel kind of stuffed, I just, I feel like I can still eat, you know, yeah. it's just, just how we are now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, I compulsively ate, um, a 10 pound bag of gummy bears when I was 12, you know, it's like, uh, just, we, we had Costco for the first time I ever saw it. And maybe we saw this thing in the candy. I was just, I mean, it was just a kid's just, you know, uh, wildest dream. There's 10 pounds bag of gummy bears. Gummy bears are not that heavy, right? They're, they're not very dense. And so this was like, this was like a, like a full on, like, you know, commercial size bag of cement size bag of gummy bears. And I was like, Oh my God, mom, can we please get that? She's like, yeah, all right, fine. And, uh, you know, summer break and it was just sort of, you know, sitting there like, you know, watching TV, playing video games. And I just had this thing cut open and I was just eating handfuls of gummy bears. And at first it was just amazing that gummy bears were like my favorite candy. And, um, and, uh, and so I was just eating just handfuls of this stuff. And at first it was just amazing. I was just like, oh my God, this is so great. And, uh, but fairly soon it just started like, you know, my mouth just started feeling like it was just like raw and sore and didn't, it wasn't really tasting good anymore. I couldn't stop eating it. I just, I had to keep eating. It. I just had to keep doing it. And my mouth was like getting more, it was more painful. It was even getting painful to actually eat this stuff because my, my mouth was so raw from this stuff. And I just kept eating it and I, I just kept eating it, kept eating it, kept eating it. And, uh, I, I made a massive dent in this thing. And, uh, and then it was like dinner time. You were like, Oh, you know, Anthony dinner. And I was just like, I was like, Oh, okay. It's dinner time. I can eat. And I was like, I've been just eating just handfuls of gummy bears all day. Like I, I, I don't need to eat. And I was like, I'll just go up and be social. And, um, you yeah, had a bit of chicken, whatever went to bed. I was just like disgusted with myself. Woke up in the morning. I'm like, Oh, gummy bears. I'm like, Oh, what am I doing? And uh, <laughs> I was just like, um, went out there and I was just like, well, maybe they'll taste okay. And like, okay, they tasted good again. Like, okay, they tasted good. But then like very quickly, like much more quickly, they tasted bad again. And I just kept doing it. I just kept eating it and just kept eating them. And I think that, you know, I, I sort of ate like another third of it like that night and uh, went to bed. And then I was just like, I was just like, all right, you know what? Screw it. I'm just, I'm just going to power through this and just finish it and just get it done and get the bell <laughs> out of here. And, and so I polished this off and I, I don't know if it was two days or three days, but it was not, a, it was not long enough. It was, it was uh, uh, way too much because, you know, I just felt compelled. It didn't taste good. I wasn't enjoying it at that point, but I just, I just, just something was telling me I just had to keep eating it. And, um, you know, that, that's what this stuff is designed to do. It's designed to be compulsive. It's designed to be addictive so that you eat more of it. They don't, they don't care. They're putting, uh, you know, profits before people. Absolutely. I mean, there's, there's no question about it. I mean, in the pharmaceutical companies, they have said that, you know, there was a, there was a, a slide from a meeting at, uh, at uh, what Goldman Sachs that was leaked and it said, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but it said something to, to along the lines of, um, you know, is it, 
uh, is it a profitable business model to uh, cure somebody of disease? And, you know, the answer, of course, is no, you know, because if you cure them, then you just give them, you know, the treatment and then it's gone, right? But if you if you treat the disease, you treat the symptoms of the disease, well, then you got them forever, right? You know, you're treating high blood. If you cure high blood pressure, well, it's gone. But if you treat high blood pressure, you're selling them pills every single day, you know, for the next 60 years, potentially. And, and then more and more and more and more and more and more and more because you're not addressing the underlying root cause. And so that's getting worse. And so now you need more and more and more as you go. And uh, diabetes is the same way. Uh, autoimmunity, definitely. That's very expensive to treat. Uh, Alzheimer's, cancer, Parkinson's, all these sorts of things. That's um, It just is something that's you know allowed to perpetuate because it is more profitable for us to be sick than healthy. Now in animals, like we were saying, it actually, you, you, you kill animals or they don't, they're not as healthy that costs people money. And so that's a bad thing because animals are worth something. Humans are essentially worthless. Um, especially when we're healthy, if we're sick, then we're very valuable because we're willing to pay for, uh, medical treatment and pharmaceuticals and things like that. So the incentives are, are completely switched around and, you know, animals, which we actually know a lot about animal nutrition because you can take 5,000 head of cattle here and 5,000 head of cattle here and do one thing different and see what happens. Can't do that with people. And, um, and it's worth it to them to figure out what works best for their health because they get more money if these animals are healthy and bigger and stronger. Right. And so with humans, you know, that's not where the incentive model is. The incentive model comes from when we're sick. If there's a problem, then you pay to fix it. You know, you're not paying to just have people keep you well, right? And uh, and just, you know, maintain good health. That's not where the, the money comes in. I haven't, haven't figured that one out yet anyway. Um, I mean, my, my business model is that, you know, I tell people that, you know, I'm here to teach you and get you healthy, get you better. So you don't need me anymore. And you, and you largely won't need doctors unless you're, you know, you, you break your arm or in an accident or something like that. Um, and so I, you know, I tell them my business model is to, to make you not need me and to you go away and just be healthy. And, uh, and it's a very viable business model because when people see that it actually works and there's actually, you know, people are actually getting better. Uh, yeah. You know, they, they, I see those people once a year just for a checkup, see how they're doing, but all their friends and family are coming in next. And then all their friends and family and then their friends and family. So we're always very busy, even though we're getting people well and getting them home. Right. So it's, it's a very different thing. You know, there was, um, there was a, there was a, uh, I'll probably do a post about this, but, um, there's this guy talking about how uh, in animal agriculture, they were giving people or giving animals a bunch of seed oils, you know, um, you know, whatever, whatever they, you know, they were at the time. And, uh, you know, the canola oils and, and um, vegetable oils and things like that. And they thought like, okay, well, can we give this to livestock to bring the poundage up? And they found that, yeah, yeah you did. You definitely bring the, brought the poundage up. But like then cows were having heart attacks. You know, like when have you ever heard of a cow having a heart attack, right? And I mean, humans are the only animals having heart attacks, right? And that should that should tip you off that something's something's not not right, you know, because we, we shouldn't be the only sickly, nasty you know, diseased animal. I mean, there, there's, that's, that's not how nature works. You know, there's, you know, the, the natural state of life on earth is that of health. And that, that should be our natural state too. Uh, but this was killing, killing the cows and the livestock. So they had to, they had to stop using it. And this is something that we use regularly. And we have all these studies that say the seed oils are good for you and totally fine and heart healthy. Um, and yet you have other ones that say they're not, you know, there are exactly five studies uh, that are randomized control with large power, uh, high numbers, thousands of patients, up to 10,000 patients in one where they replace animal fats and saturated fats with unsaturated, polyunsaturated, heart healthy, polyunsaturated fats, um, you know, vegetable oils, right? Margarine, things like that. Um, and many of these some were in the seventies and, they lowered LDL cholesterol. And they said, okay, does that help people? And they found out, no, it did not. In fact, uh, uh, three of them found that it didn't didn't uh, give them any improvement. And two of them that were the the better designed, uh, larger, uh, you know, larger studies that had, had more patients. 
they found that actually the that the intervention group that it, that replaced saturated fat with unsaturated heart heart healthy unsaturated uh, vegetable oils plant oils and lowered LDL cholesterol actually killed people and mm. more people were dying of heart attacks and strokes as a result of that. And so, you know, obviously, you know, since it was, these were done in the seventies, then, you know, that, that, everyone knew that that was the problem. No, because they buried it because these were being paid for by the processed food companies or being done by people in the pay of processed food companies like Ansel Keys. That one specifically, the, the Minnesota heart study was, was, uh, you know, Ansel Keys was one of the lead investigators on that and they buried it and it only got uncovered um, 40 years later by a guy named Dr. Ramsden at the NIH who uh, just was able to dig up from one of the lead investigators, children who are now doctors and spoke to them and, and they found their father's old notes and records and like floppy disks and things like that with all this data on it. And, uh, and so they, they, they looked at this and published it and went, oh my goodness, like this is this is very different. This does not support the cholesterol heart hypothesis and it certainly does not support the use of uh, seed oils. And so you have seed oils, you have nutritional studies, largely they're um, survey studies. They're, um, you know, they, they, like I said, you know, the nurses, I alluded to the nurses study at Harvard where they give nurses a, a you know, questionnaire once a year and they say, what'd you eat last year? Okay. Um, no one's going to remember that. I mean, I know what I ate last year, meat. But I, I couldn't tell you how much I ate on any given day. I could estimate, but it's not going to be accurate, you know, but it's going to be a hell of a lot more accurate than anybody else eating, a, you know, a mixed diet with a whole bunch of, you know, you know, Fritos and other sorts of random things uh, throughout their day. And, you know, so instead of doing things in an honest way and saying, okay, hey, can you just keep track of all your meals throughout the next year? They're saying, no, no, no. Tell us what you had. They've been following, they've been following the same cohort for, for years, right? They could have easily just switched around and said, hey, how about you just track what you eat? And then we'll that, that'll give us better data and be much more accurate. They don't do that. Because of course, they don't they don't want to do that. They want to be able to manipulate things in, in ways that serve their purposes. And so uh, that's that's a lot of what these survey studies are. They're survey studies. They're, um, they compare processed food to you know, uh, plant-based, you know, food, but they, and then they blame meat for, um, you know, they, they conflate uh, fast food, pizza, lasagna. They say that that all counts as meat. And it was like, there's other things in there, obviously. And, um, you know, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of confounding factors there. And, uh, but none of them are experimental, none. And so all they can do is, um, is be hypothesis generating. They can't actually tell you cause and effect. And so the only thing they can tell you cause and effect are experimental studies like those randomized controlled trials where they replace saturated fat with polyunsaturated seed oils and margarine, and it killed people. And uh, more people died of heart attacks and strokes. And they buried it and they hid that from people. And how many billions of people have been affected by that? And, uh, you know, gotten heart disease and metabolic uh, disease, cardiometabolic disease, and died early, died decades early and had heart attacks in their 30s or 40s because they were told that meat's bad, animal fat's bad, vegetable oils are good. And when trying to avoid, you know, when, and, and by trying to avoid the, you know, they got the very disease that they were trying to avoid, you know, and they got heart disease. Oh, that's because of all that meat you ate in your 20s. Like, oh, God damn it. You know, I was like, well, no, actually, because you were healthy as hell until you stopped eating the meat and then you got sick and you see this again and again. And, um, and so it's, uh, it, it's, it's really nasty. And I, honestly, it's, it's a crime against humanity because these people knew these people do know that this stuff causes harm and they are manipulating data and manipulating people into, you know, thinking something that's not true and then making health decisions that are harmful and it's killing people. And uh, when you do that knowingly, you know, that, that it, to me is a crime. I mean, that's uh, knowledge of forethought. You know, it's like well poisoners, you know, you, you, you poison the well and tell everybody, yeah, the water's fine. It's great. I just had some, it's awesome. You know, and then they all get sick and die. You're, you're responsible for that. You know, that's murder. And so, you know, if you're doing something that you, you know, causes harm, like exchanging animal fat for, vegetable oils and margarine, like in the Minnesota trial, 
and you're a company that does that and you bury that so you can keep selling your poisons to people, you, you should go to prison, you know, or, or be shot, really probably shot because the, the amount of people that, that you've hurt and killed is, is astronomical. And, um, you know, when, the, when the tobacco companies got really a slap on the wrist, they got a, you know, fine $400 billion. Oh my goodness. Who gives a shit? You know, how many millions of people died because of their product that they lied for decades to say was actually safe, didn't cause disease, wasn't addictive. Same thing. You know, they, they lied in front of Congress saying it wasn't addictive. Oh, we have these studies that say it's not addictive. And we have these studies that say it's, uh, you know, it doesn't cause cancer and doesn't cause emphysema and doesn't cause all these problems. It doesn't cause heart disease. Oh, so I mean, oh, oh you know, what, what do we do? It's like, yeah, but they're your studies and your studies are fake as hell, you know? And now these tobacco companies bought up all the food companies and doing the exact same thing. Oh, it's not addictive. Oh, it's not a problem. It doesn't cause cancer. Oh my God. Same people, it's the same people doing the same thing. Those people should have been in prison, should have made an example of them. They lied in front of Congress for 30 years and they falsified studies and, uh, and knowingly lied about this, right? And, um, and so they were able to push out this, this death product to people. People died and they got cancer and emphysema. And, uh, and they were, you know, they made candy cigarettes to try to hook kids early and all this sort of stuff. Same thing. You know, they're trying to hook them early, keep them for life because that's what drug dealers do. You get kids hooked and you sell it to them for the rest of their life. It was all about their bottom line. And so when you put profits above people and you knowingly do things that, that cause harm and death, that's a crime to me. And uh, it's certainly, uh, yeah, it's just a flat out crime against humanity. And I, and I think it's, it's very important for us to wake up and see this. And, uh, and uh, you know, if cause they're not going to, they're not going to tell us this, they're not going to admit this. We just have to figure it out. And um, we have to get the hell away from it ourselves. And, um, and it's, you know, because it's, it's still at least a semi-free uh, society where you can choose what you buy and don't buy. They're not trying to make that difficult. They're trying to make it impossible to buy meat now. Um, same people trying to lobby for this. But if we if we wake up and uh, you know we we choose not to buy this stuff, then they don't they don't get to sell it. And that's all there is to it. And they have to change their market plan. So that's that's what I've been trying to do is just wake people up and and get them to just just eat actual food for actual humans and not this garbage that uh, doesn't belong in our bodies in any shape or form. Boom, mic drop right there. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, you. we vote with our dollars. We vote with yeah. our dollars. And um, yeah, I. It's, it's a travesty of what's going on. You know, I look at when you're mentioning like people, it, at, in my head, I'm thinking of like my dad. My dad, smoker for years, uh, just not good nutrition. He has COPD, had a uh, quadruple bypass and yeah. you know and it's and he worked out and he tried to do his best and he was getting you know starting to get back in shape and you know and just had to go in and they're like oh we you we're, we're getting you surgery today you know so it's just like one of those things that he didn't know any better he thought he was doing the right things and you know we've been lied to and it's just mm -hmm. something that we need to like you said we need to wake up we need to spread the word. We need to vote with our dollars. Uh, I know this, we can keep going on and on and on. Um, I know I want to respect your time. Um, any, before we get going, any like new things coming up for you or any endeavors in the future that you're looking forward to? Oh, well, just, just conferences. So you have, um, uh, I'll be speaking in San Diego at the symposium for metabolic health. And then, and I'll be in, mid August and then like August 17th or that weekend of August 17th. And then after that, I'll be uh, speaking at um, it's sort of a, like a, it's called the beef city uh, roundup in Wyoming in Riverton, Wyoming. So that's just sort of for fun. And uh, it's just really nice people. And uh, there'll be you know, a bunch of us there, like Dr. Sean Amara, myself, Dr. Lisa Wiedemann, um, uh, Simon Lewis, who I do the how to carnivore stuff with um, Bella steak and butter gal and um, Courtney Luna, and um, there'll be a few other people as well, but um, I'm uh, Angela Lero, who's uh, who's been a guest on my podcast. 
And I think I might be forgetting, oh yeah, and uh, Jake from Life Like Jake. And so, and, and there may be some more others as well. But so, you know, it's a good group of carnivore people. They're trying to make it like the biggest carnivore convention in the in the country every year. And um, they just started, sort of got on this idea last year. And because I was there as like a you know, celebrity judge for a steak uh, competition. It's just like big, best steak in the West or whatever. And, and there was just like, hey, do you want to come to... Wyoming and uh and, and eat some steaks. Uh, and eat some steak. And <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, yes, I absolutely do. That sounds awesome. And uh, you know, someone out there and then went up to the Tetons and the Yellowstone and it's amazing. Absolutely loved it there. And um and so yeah, so it was great. And um they're they're doing it bigger this year and they're trying they're really trying to make it make it a big event every year. So we'll we'll um uh be there uh the week after so that'll be the weekend of the twenty fourth. And then just, yeah, and then just more more conferences, speaking at a medical conference in Manchester in October. And then the week after, I'll be in Spain, in, just outside of Malaga as well. And then uh, low carb down under here in, there's a medical conference here in Australia in, in Melbourne. So those are, those are the main things. I just sort of got conferences every month that I'll be speaking at. So if people are around, I'll be sort of announcing these things as I go. Uh, but that's the next one anyway, is in San Diego on the 17th or the weekend of the 17th of August. Amazing. Amazing. Well, again, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and, you know, best of luck to, you know, all the events. I know that everybody's going to be super excited to have you come out and speak. Yeah. yeah. Well, I hope so. And it's, it's always fun. It's always really nice to meet people, see the other speakers and get to interact with people that you've, you, you know, you met online and you're doing podcasts with and things like that. It's always great to, to sort of, to actually meet people in person and hang out. So I always look forward to those. It's always really nice. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you taking the time and thanks everybody listening to the Primal Foundations podcast.